Spirit of God, we give you thanks for giving to us these words through prophets and apostles of the past. We ask now that you will apply them to our hearts, that we might live in such a way that we honor God with our bodies. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Please be seated, and let's take our Bibles and turn, please. Turn, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the passage that Elio read for us. Our focus this morning is, is verses 9 through 20. In this series in 1 Corinthians, we've discovered that the letter opens with a concern that the Apostle Paul has about divisions within the church. He wants the church to be united and not gather around certain factions that are related to leaders within the church. That's the first problem that he addresses with, and we have looked at that quite thoroughly. The second issue that he deals with is that of personal holiness. And last Sunday, we saw that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where Paul reveals in this letter that there was a man in the Corinthian church who was living a grossly sexually immoral life. And because of his unrepentant mindset, because of his uh, obstinate heart, uh, the Apostle Paul encouraged the church that they needed to put this man out of the fellowship of their church, not only for the sake of the individual, but for the sake of the church as well, for the sake of the personal holiness of the church. Now, in chapter 6, the Apostle Paul continues uh, to talk about this, uh, the, the, um, this truth of sexual pure, pure, purity that should be seen in the lives of all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before we look at these verses, we've already read them. I think we have a general understanding of what they're all about. Before we look at this, I want to say a few things that I think are necessary uh, in order to help us view these verses in their proper light. What I mean by that is there are lots of verses in the Bible, passages of Scripture, which um, lay down a number of prohibitions for sexual activity. And the tendency that people then have, because they see these prohibitions in God's Word, is they then come to the erroneous conclusion, oh, sex is bad. I mean, why is God so negative on it? Sex must be bad. But as we look through the lens of these other helpful truths, we see that the prohibitions concerning sexual activity are there not because sex is bad, but because sex is good. So the first thing we want to keep in mind this morning is that, is that God created sex. Sex is not a bad thing. God is not some celestial killjoy who wants to rain down on our party, so to speak. But, but, but sexual prohibitions are put there in the Bible in order to protect the good gift that God has given. Remember when God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis chapter 1 goes through the, the six days of creation. And what is that constant refrain at the end of each day? And there was morning and there was evening the first day, right? And God saw that it was good, good. God saw that it was good. God intends sex then to be a good and a wonderful gift that comes from himself, to be experienced at the right time, and to be experienced in the right way. And so it is because of this specialness of sex, the maintaining of that specialness, that God gives these prohibitions in his word. If we have any doubts about this at all, there's actually a book of the Bible called the Song of Songs, and the whole book is dedicated to romantic, erotic, sexual love. It's written in rich uh, poetic imagery describing private emotions and intimate body parts, but it's always done in the Song of Songs appropriately, tastefully, erotically, but not pornographically. I'm sure many of you are going to go home and read that book this afternoon. <laughs> but it is a celebration of sexual love and intimacy. 
So as we think of God creating sex, we also know that he's made us male and female. We are sexual beings. And that sexuality that we have is not just physiological in nature, it is psychological in nature too. There is a distinction between man and woman. And we celebrate the difference between the two. God has made us male and female. It's, it's a part of our humanness. It's fundamental to who we really are. And that's why it's difficult to talk about sexual sin, to talk about this topic, because it's hard for us to remove ourselves as sexual beings made in God's image as male and female from the fact that we are also sexual sinners and rebellious against what God has intended to be good for us in life. To put it in another way, because we are sexual, humanly, it's hard to talk about this topic without it touching at the very center of our personalities. Adam, when he was created, he he became aware of his sexuality when God made a woman for him. You remember his words. The Lord brought the woman to the man and said, and said here, here, here she is, Adam. And Adam said, and again, with poetic words, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. That, that's just Adam's way of saying, wow, a woman. He was sexually awakened at that moment in time. And it was good. It was good. But we are fallen human beings, made in the image of God, yes. But we are fallen human beings who we have, the, the, the image of God has been marred in us. We, we have fallen into sin, and, and this sin is not just an action we commit, it's a, it's a sense of being who we are. And, and this, this brokenness, this sinfulness has, has, has broken us, and it has confused us. Sin has touched all areas of our humanness, including our sexuality. So we are broken and we are confused. And as human beings, we often deviate from the ideal that God presents to us in terms of sexual relationships. Sexual immorality, which this passage deals with, is all types of sexual activity and sexual expression outside of the bonds of covenant marriage that is contrary to his ideals. And so you and I have, as those made in the image of God, male and female, we have incredible potential for glory and incredible potential for tragedy. We have sexual potential. We have sexual problems. And that's why you and I should not be surprised at the, at the culture war that is raging around us at this present time. A culture war all about sexual identity, all about gender dysphoria, all about transgressionism. Sorry, transgenderism. The whole use and the proliferation of pornography in our day and age. We, we should not be surprised by this. Why? Because, because human beings are sexually broken. We are confused. We are rebellious. And the result is exactly what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 1, where we have, we have moved away from our Creator, and therefore we have, our thinking has become futile, and our hearts have become darkened. And we begin to pursue other things and other desires, which in reality become an idol in themselves. Men having relations with men, women having relations with women. Paul talks about this. It's because of our brokenness. Now, if these are the truths that we, we, we have in our minds now, they're truths. They're like a window. It's like a framework. It's like a lens. And now we zoom in on 1 Corinthians 6, and we begin to understand what the Apostle Paul is talking about because we see it in its proper light. Just a word about the situation in Corinth. We've talked about that in the past. They've given over to philosophy. They, the philosophers who would ply their trades on the street. People getting caught up with the wisdom of words. But in addition to the philosophy, the philosophies, there, there was also the proliferation of prostitution within the city. 
there's a, an ancient Greek word called Acropolis. Acrop, Acropolis simply means the, the high point in the city. And, and the, each one of the Greek cities would have an Acrop, Acrop, Acropolis. Today we would refer to it as the downtown. But this was the high point in the city, sort of like Hamilton Mountain. And this is where the temple of Apollos was and the temple of Aphrodite who, is the, who was the goddess of, of sexual love, sexual beauty. The Romans referred to her as Venus. The Egyptians called her Hathar. The, Can, the, Can, the, Can, the Canaanites who occupied the promised land when Israel came in called her Ashtaroth. You remember you read First and Second Kings and there's this thing about the Ashtaroth poles. These were just poles that were erected as worship places to Aphrodite. And, and there on the, the Acrocorinth, or the Acropolis of the city of Corinth, was this temple to Aphrodite filled with a thousand priestesses to Aphrodite. And every one of those priestesses is a prostitute. And the way men have worship with Aphrodite is they engage in sexual relations with the priestess. Paul's talking about the here, that here, actually, in, in this ch chapter, chapter, when verse 16, he says, don't you know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? And here, and I'm, I'm jumping ahead several weeks now, but here I think there's a warning, not just about the sin of sexuality or sexual immorality, but the sex of spirituality that is not linked to the one true and living, and living God, because there's an element of idolatry in this. And Paul says it's, it's one thing for a Christian whose body is the member of Christ to unite himself with a prostitute, but to unite himself with a prostitute who's a priestess? in a temple to a pagan god? I'm jumping ahead several weeks, but do you, do, you, do you realize how you open yourself up then to all of the demonic world associated with false worship? To have intercourse then with a, with a priestess prostitute is to have intercourse with the demonic. Well, there's so much more that I could say here. But this was the situation in Corinth at this time, and the, the atmosphere was sexually charged. And so, what the Corinthians did, their, their philosophers would, would, would they, their, their philosophers had nice little short, pithy proverbs that, that they, would, they would use. Today, we'd call them one-liners. And those one-liners supposedly have a lot of wisdom to them. But the one-liners are really propaganda statements. They're, they're, they're a means by which we propagate a certain philosophy, and, and the Corinthians had that. And we see here in this passage, first of all, what the world teaches. Notice verse 12. Here's the first philosophy proverb that's mentioned. It's in quotes. Everything is permissible for me. There it is. Have you heard similar to that? Hey, everything's okay. No prohibitions whatsoever. He repeats it twice, actually, in verse 12. And then he gives the second one. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. You see, these, these little pithy philosophy proverbs not only uh, reflect a certain way of thinking, but they propagate that way of thinking also. All things are permissible for me. So we translate this now into sexual activity. Anything goes. There's no prohibitions. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. Well, if, I, if my stomach is craving food, what do I do? Well, I satisfy the urge in my stomach. I satisfy that hunger by eating. And, and frankly, I can, I can satisfy my, my hunger urges through all different kinds of foods, not just one. So, food for the stomach and the stomach for food. So, so if I have a sexual urge, just like a, a physical hunger pain, well, then I'm going to satisfy that urge. And I can satisfy that urge in, in a number of different ways. You see, the urge to eat and the urge for sex were equated with each other. 
The point was, there's no difference between eating and having sex because each satisfies a particular physical desire. Now, we, we hear these philosophy proverbs echoed to this very day. We hear it in words like, well, you know, I have to do what's right for me. And, uh, you, you know, as, as, as long as nobody gets hurt, it's okay. I found it interesting when, when it was revealed several weeks back that John Tory um, was resigning uh, from the mayorship of the city of Toronto uh, because he'd had an affair with, a, with a, a staff worker. It was interesting. It didn't matter. It didn't really matter which media source you read on that, whether it was the Toronto Sun or the Toronto Star or the Globe and Mail. It really, really didn't matter. It, it didn't even matter whether it was City News or Global News or CBC or CTV News. Not once did anyone use the word adultery. It was never used. Everybody knew that's what it was, but the word was never used. He was having an affair. He was romantically involved. He had a relationship with a staffer. I mean, there were all kinds of, of different expressions that were used, and not only, did, not only did these little expressions kind of sugarcoat everything, but like the Proverbs here in Corinthians did, but they actually, they actually deceive, and they, they, actually, they actually make what happened less serious, less sinful. Now, Dr. Albert uh, Ellis, an Ameri American psy psychologist, has re written a book about 20 or 25 years ago entitled Sex Without Guilt, Sex Without Guilt, and he was the one who coined the phrase healthy adultery. And he said that really what it can do in the end is, is rejuvenate a marriage relationship. 22 years ago, the, the Ashley Madison Agency was founded in the city of Toronto. Uh, this is a dating, sort of a dating agency, but not for singles. It's a dating agency for married people so they can have an affair. And their, their, their motto was, life is short, have an affair. Again, a little pithy philosophy proverb. On their, web, their website years ago, it said, our service is not meant to glorify or promote infidelity. We're simply offering a safe and anonymous way for people to communicate with each other once they make up their minds to explore options outside their married relationship. Now, not everybody drinks this kind of Kool-Aid, but suffice to say, there's lots of these philosophy proverbs in circulation today but all they really do is justify sinful behavior. So that's what the world teaches or the world propagates. Now, now let's consider what, what the word teaches. And, and that starts in verse 13 where the Apostle Paul comes right out and says, God will destroy them both. And then he says, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Now, I want you to notice two times in one sentence he's used the word body. And what the word teaches here is, is something to do with the Lord and the, the human body. The Lord and my body. The Lord and your body. There, there is a relationship, Paul says, between the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus himself, and our bodies. The key word in the passage is body or bodies. It's actually found eight times, but it's actually mentioned more than that. Sometimes the word body isn't used, but it's clear he's talking about the body, the relationship of the Lord with the body. And when he talks about body here, what we need to understand, this is what so many people miss. When he talks about body here, he's talking more than just about the physical you. He's talking more than, about, more than just about our flesh, our bones, our organs. He's talking now about what is really inside of us. Our body is, is soul and spirit as well. He's talking about you. The body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the, bo the body. You are for the Lord, and you are for, and the body, you are for the Lord. And the Lord is for you. You see, the word that he uses is the word soma. Now, usually when we're just talking about 
flesh, a different word is used. We're just talking about something physical, a different word is used. But the word here is soma, and soma is so much more than just that which is physical. You see, the Greeks, they, they believed that, 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 that you could somehow separate your body from your soul, that, 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 that the spirit of a man was different from the, from the physical body of a, of a man. So, so you can do whatever you want with your body, and it never affects your soul. Your soul is pure. doesn't matter what you do with your body. And, and this was a part of their philosophy that, that sexual activity has no, has no bearing on the soul, has no, has no effect on the soul. But let's go back to the first proverb in verse 12. Everything is permissible for me, but he says, but not everything's beneficial. Doesn't benefit you. Why? Well, he repeats it again, verse 12. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Why is it not, why isn't everything beneficial? Well, because we can be dominated by a certain thing. Something can master us. Something can dominate us. Paul's saying here that that sexual sin masters us. We don't master it. It, it, It dominates us. Sexual sin is addictive in behavior. You can't easily break free from sexual sin. And the worst case scenario of all of of this is sexual sin can actually define a person's life. It can set a person on a trajectory in life that only leads to destruction in the end. Paul is arguing here that, that, that sex outside of marriage is not hel- helpful because it creates a bondage to your soma, to you. And this is because of the nature of our bodies. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. But, but God will destroy them both. You, in other words, you have to think about God in all of this. And so this close parallel then that that the Corinthians are believing between the food and sex, Paul just, he knocks this to the ground. It falls to the ground and he gives six arguments in this passage about sexual immorality and the body and how this relates to the Lord. And what Paul wants all of us to understand here is the significance of the body to the Lord. What the body is meant for, the destiny of the body, how the body can be harmed, and the ownership of the body. And in verse 13, he points out that our bodies matter to God. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. The body is for the Lord. It belongs to him. God created your body. Therefore, it matters what we do with it, with our bodies. In short, he's saying that, that sexual immorality is inconsistent with the purpose of our body, with the purpose of our creation. Verse 14, he, he goes on, by his power, God raised from the Lord the dead, and he will raise us also. <laughs> Why does Paul bring in the resurrection of the body in the future into a discussion about sexual sin? He says, you have to look forward to the future. As you look into the future, you see that our bodies are going to be resurrected at a future date. And you and I are going to live with our bodies, in our bodies, forever. Now, some of you might wish to have had a different body than the one that's already been given to you. Sorry, you got to wait for the resurrection because there will be a transformation of your body, but you'll probably look pretty much the way you do now because there's going to be a continuity of the body too. It'll be like the body of the Lord Jesus. And his body was transformed, but his body continued at the same time. What's he saying? When you, when you, when you give your body over to immoral things, that is inconsistent with the destiny of your bodies. Verse 15 and 16, we've already touched on this, but... Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Yeah. Do, do, you, do you understand that? You say you're a Christian. You say you're a follower of Jesus. Your body are members of Christ. 
They're a part of this larger body. In other words, you are in union with Jesus Christ. All of you in union with Christ. Then he poses a hypothetical question here. Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Don't you know, verse 16, that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said that the two will become one flesh. That's, that's the verse that com, comes out of Genesis. That's the verse that talks about marriage. That's the verse that talks about when a man and a woman come together in a covenant relationship, they become one flesh. He's saying, do you realize that, that when you engage in sexual activity outside the marriage bond with a prostitute or with whoever, you're... you're you're actually violating that union that you have with Jesus and you're distorting the marriage union. It is a rebellious act of independence separate from the Lord, but you're united to the Lord. The next thing he mentions is in verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. Notice the next line. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. You've got to read that verse a couple of times. Now, the pronoun here is he, but it could apply to she as well. He or she. What's he talk, talking about here? Well, this, this verse is very mes- easily misunderstood, and some people read this verse and say, there you go. The worst sin a person can commit is a sexual sin. Like, that's like an unforgivable sin. Is that what Paul's saying? It's not what he says here in this passage. It's definitely not what he says, because if you go back to verses 9 through 11, it's clear that many of them had, were sexual offenders. They, they had broken God's sexual laws. But verse 11 says, you're now washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. So, so, so Jesus, hallelujah, can, can cleanse us of any kind of sin, sexual or otherwise. So that's not really what he's getting at here. But what he is saying is that there is a, there's something unique about the character of sexual sin. Sexual sin has peculiar effects upon a person, upon your body, upon your person, upon your psyche. That's what soma means. It affects you. In other words, sexual sin does greater damage to the person who commits the sin. It is the most damaging of all sins in terms of a person's well-being. Jack Hayford wrote once, sexual sins are worse than other sins, not because they're harder for God to forgive them, but because they're more damaging at a personal and social dimension than other sins. And he's right on. He's saying there is, there is destructive fallout that comes to you because of sexual sin. There's personal damage. There's collateral damage. Damage to, to, to the foundations of your identity. That sexual sin actually exploits the, the deepest aspects of our emotions. I've made reference to this before, but 22 years ago there was a a movie that came out, the two stars in the movie were Tom Cruise and Cameron Diaz. The movie was entitled Vanilla Sky. And in the opening scene of the movie, Tom Cruise comes, he's in an apartment building, and he comes down in the, the, the elevator to the lobby, and he exits through the doors out into the street. He's just been upstairs where he's had a sexual fling with his latest flame, And Cameron Diaz is around the corner waiting for him, and he is her former, his former, she is his former girlfriend with whom he was very sexually involved. And the relationship has broken up, but she can't get over him, and she is emotionally distraught, and she essentially is pleading with him on the street to come back to her, and he pushes her off. He finally agrees to give her a ride to where she needs to go. And in the car, she continues to come on to him and talk to him and plead with him that let's not end this relationship. It's too important, yada, yada, yada. 
And Cruz keeps putting her off. He wants nothing to do with her. And she says these words. Listen to these words. Don't you know that when you sleep with someone, your body makes a promise whether you do or not? Wow. There it is. Biblical wisdom from Cameron Diaz. (laughs) Don't you know that when you sleep with someone, your body makes a promise whether you do or not? You see, your body is more than your body. Your body is your soma. It's you. And in the sex act, an attachment happens. And it's more than just a physical attachment. It's not just physical. It is that, but it's more than that. It's, it's not just a moment. It's more than that. It's not momentary. It's not temporal. It's, it's a far-lasting kind of an attachment that happens. That's why Paul's giving the warnings. He's trying to protect the good gift that God has given. Dr. Miriam Grossman is a psychiatrist at UCLA in the United States, and she wrote a few years ago a book entitled Unprotected. And in the book, she talks about how campuses in the United States, and the same is true here, have been overtaken with a political correctness that seems to dominate campus life. She mentions that health and counseling centers on on American campuses are promoting a radical social uh, agenda that has dire consequences. Her study is based on interviews and counseling with 2,000 young men and women, mostly women. And she goes on and she, she says that she has seen with her own eyes that this anything goes safe sex agenda is actually making young men and women sick. She goes after the philosophy that, hey, you know, just protect, just protect yourself. All you need is a condom and you're safe. And she says there's such a fixation on that that, that that people are missing the real point. She says there's no such thing as safe sex. She says the issue isn't protecting yourself with a condom. The issue is your soul, your soul, your soma. In an interview she did shortly after she wrote her book, she was asked, how are students unprotected? And she says, when they are constantly bombarded with this false security that is engendered over time, that all they need is to do something physical, like a condom, to keep themselves safe, without any reference to the psychological suffering that comes through sexual activity outside of marriage. She says, we wonder why so many young people suffer from depression, anxiety, eating disorders, and self-abuse. Listen, here's the point she makes. A young woman is not warned that she is hardwired to attach through sexual behavior and that no condom will protect her from the heartbreak and the confusion that may result. Cameron Diaz again. Don't you know that when, you're bo- when you sleep with someone, your body makes a promise, even if you don't? Dawn Eden is a, a, a woman who, who lived a very promiscuous life for a number of years. She has written a book entitled The Thrill of the Chaste. She uh, converted to Christian belief and is a devout Roman Catholic. And she writes in her book, The Thrill of the Chaste, she says, I would still feel as though the act, the sex act, had bonded me with my sex partner in a deeper way than we had bonded before. All the sex I ever had, far from bringing me closer to personal fulfillment in marriage, in the marriage that I sought, had only made me less capable of attaining marriage or even a committed relationship. Friends, this is exactly what Paul is saying in this one line in verse 18. All other sins a person commits are outside that person's body. But the person who sins sexually sins against his or her own body. In other words, we're not made for this other stuff. That is not how God designed us. God has designed us in such a way that through sexual intercourse, a husband and a wife form a lifelong attachment. 
And when you attach yourself to the wrong person or to multiple persons, you do damage not only to the person you slept with, but to yourself as well. Paul goes on then in verse 19, and he gives another reason. He says, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? The Holy Spirit lives in every believer. And what does the Holy Spirit seek for us? What does the Holy Spirit move us toward? He moves us toward holy living. Sin is inconsistent with our calling in Christ. And then in verse 20, last line of verse 19, you are not your own, verse 20, you were bought at a price. Our body belongs to Christ who redeemed us. In other words, sexual immorality is inconsistent with our redemption in Christ. So what does the word command us to do then? Well, look at verse 18. Flee, he says. Flee from sexual immorality. Look at verse 20, second commandment. Therefore, honor God with your body. These are the two commands that are actually given. Flee. It's foolish not to flee, Paul says. And we're to honor God. We're to give glory to God. Our bodies are His. They're for the Lord. They're raised to be with Him and by Him. He purchased them. We're united to Him. So honor God with your body, your, the totality of your soma. Listen, you, you, can't look at, you can't look at porn and honor God. You can't fornicate and give glory to God. You can't commit adultery and give glory to God. Now, these are important commands. So we need to talk for just a few minutes this morning about how do we obey, obey, obey them, and what if we have broken these commands? So I want to give you just a number of takeaway points here. First of all, I want to talk about help in obeying these commands, the command to flee and the command to honor God. Now, these are not exhaustive. This is not exhaustive advice, but I hope it will be helpful. And the first thing I'd like, I'd like to say this morning is this. I say this to everyone here who's single today and anticipating marriage in the future. You need to begin right now, right now, right now today. You need to make a commitment today that you're going to lay a foundation for your marriage to come before you are married. The greatest gift that an individual can give to a future spouse is sexual purity. And some of you may say, well, I can't do that now. I've blown it. Okay? I'm sorry. But you can give your future spouse your sexual purity from this day forward. Isn't that right? That you, you might be able to say to a future husband, a future wife, from this day forward in my life, I made a commitment to Jesus Christ. And I've been true to that. I've been true to, true to that. And I've been pure from this day for, forward. An incredible gift that you can give. Listen, when you, when, you, when you continue to have sex outside of marriage, and then you hope somehow that by getting married, like that puts an end to all of that, it really doesn't. Because what's happened is you've already established a pattern of behavior that you're going to find very hard to break, no matter how much you love your, fu your future spouse. Because once you've jettisoned purity in the past, it's so much easier, easier to jettison purity in the future. Remember, sexual sin can master you. It is an addic addictive thing. So you need to resolve today that you're going to live for the glory of God, that you're going to flee, to do whatever is necessary to maintain your purity before God. And that may involve you becoming accountable to someone, someone who you can trust in the Lord, a, a godly individual in your life. Remember what James says, that we're, we're to confess our sins or our faults to one another and pray for one another that we might be healed. I think in this area that uh, uh, any kind of sin that so grasps us and binds us, any kind of that sin, any, any kind of sin of that nature 
needs to be personally repented of, confessed before God, but there needs to be another step attached to that because many of us, we keep, we keep saying, Lord, I'm sorry, we go back to it again. Lord, I'm sorry, we do it again because it, it's, it's developed a pattern in our, our lives. And at that point, it's no longer just personal confession to God. There has to be the confession to someone else who will then hold you accountable for future actions. Confess your faults to one another, the Bible says. And then he adds, and pray for one another that you might be healed. That's where healing comes. That's where the, that's where the power of God is unleashed to, to break these things that bind us. The next thing I would say to those of us who are married, and I direct this primarily to the men, though it applies in to everyone, but I want to speak to the men here, and that we must make our wives our source of enjoyment. We must learn to delight in our wives. Proverbs tells us that we're to drink water, water, drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. If you have any doubt about what he's getting at here. He says, may your fountain be blessed. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth and may her breasts, not someone else's, but her breasts satisfy you always. May you be captivated by her love. Now, how does that happen, man? Well, it doesn't happen by watching porn and fantasizing about other women and hoping that your woman will become like the woman you're watching on the screen. Your wife is your helpmate. She's not your personal porn star. It doesn't happen by by wanting to have sex with her all of the time, but it happens when you begin each day with a resolve in your heart and a prayer in your heart, Lord, help me this day to love my wife as Christ loved the church. Lord, give me this day opportunities to share, to show how I care for her to cherish her. Help me, Lord, to love her selflessly and sacrificially. Lord, make me aware today of how I can serve my wife. And guys, when she begins to feel that, and that becomes the pattern of your life, you will be captivated by her love. We also need to make, take great care in our associations with other people. We need to build parameters into our lives, preventative measures, in order that we not develop unhealthy desires. As a pastor over the years, it, this hasn't happened like every week or, in, or, or anything, but there have been numerous occasions when I have served God in the, in the past where individuals have come to me who are now trapped in an adulterous relationship. There's a desire to repent. There's a brokenness over what they have done. And the story has often been something like this. I entered into a conversation with a member of the opposite sex who was married, and we began to talk about things that were not appropriate for us to talk about. Like a woman sharing with a man in the office that her relationships with with her husband is on the rocks. Because she's looking for emotional support at that point in time. And then you hear the story, and then you want to give that emotional support. You want to help. That's where it starts. It starts with wanting to help. But you see, a listening ear eventually becomes a gentle touch, and a gentle touch becomes something else. So we have to determine before God that we're not, we're not going to put ourselves in those kinds of compromised sit, sit situations. You know what often happens here? We hear a person's story, whether it's a man or a a woman, and um, and the woman might hear a man talk about how his how broken he is and and the marriage relationship. And this is how our sinful mind plays tricks with us. We begin to establish an emotional bond with that person, and then our thinking gets warped because we think the woman thinks this: I can give him what his wife cannot. In other words, it becomes noble. It becomes noble. And it's not noble at all. It's a deception from the pit of hell. So we need to establish those parameters in terms of the associations we have. 
The next thing I would say is that we have to guard our hearts by guarding our eyes, by guarding our eyes. Jesus warned us about our eyes. You remember his very hard saying where he said, if your eye offends you, what are you supposed supposed to do? Pluck it out. Pluck it out. In other words, we have to deal ruthlessly with what we look at. We can't, we can't help everything that comes across our, our vision because we, we live in a culture now where porn is the norm. But we can be very careful about we, what we intentionally set before our eyes. Job said, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look upon a woman. I remember years, years ago there was a, a, a porn producer who, who became a follower of Christ. And he continued to struggle with his life. And he, he, said, he said this. He said, I wish I just had an erase button for my memory. I wish that's what I had. There's so much more I could say, I could say but time does not allow me here. But listen, guys, looking, looking at porn actually destroys your ability to be intimate with your spouse. It creates a fantasy world that can never be realized. It sets in place false expectations that you bring into your marriage relationship. And there's nothing of reality in it. 300 years ago, a Puritan writer by the name of Thomas Watson, 300 years ago, wrote these words. Pornography secretly conveys poison to the heart. It injects poison into the heart. Guard your eyes. Guard your heart by guarding your eyes. Now, what about help for those of us who've broken these commands? And most of us, in one way or another, probably have because we are all sexual sinners. The first thing I would say is this. If we are married, we need to really consider the ramifications of what unfaithfulness will actually mean. If you're single, we've talked already about some of this damage that you can bring into your marriage because of the ties that you have with individuals you've been intimate with before in the past. But if you're married, you need to think this all all through. There's an incredible book that was written years ago by a British evangelist by the name of Roy Hessian. The title of the book is Forgotten Factors. It's about the forgotten factors of sexual sin. He goes on in that book to describe David, King David. Remember, he looked at Bathsheba, desired her, brought her to the palace, had sex with her, she conceived. What did he do next? Well, then he, he's got to get rid of the husband, so he sends Uriah out to the battle. Essentially, he murdered him. You see, what, what, what Hessian says is that when we try to cover up this sin, it leads to another sin and to another sin. If you, if you are being unfaithful to your, to, to your spouse, your life is filled with lying. It's filled with lying. There's no way around this without lying. And after a while, your lies begin to trap you. And one, you you have to commit more sin in order to cover up the one sin. Hessian goes on in his book, and he talks about the fact, he says, imagine, imagine, sir, he says, what are you going to say to your son and to your daughter? when it becomes known to them that you are unfaithful to their mother? What are you going to say to try to justify yourself in your daughter's eyes? He says, these are the things we need to think about. He goes on to say, consider the impact you will have on your son or on your daughter if you can look them in the face in the future and say to them on the day that they get married, I was faithful to your mother all the days of my life. Consider the ramifications of being unfaith, unfaithful. Secondly, we need to repent deeply and thoroughly. Can I be really frank? Most repentance in evangelical sh- circles and churches is shallow. We take very, very little time in confessing our sins. Very little time in mourning over our state. Very little time in repenting thoroughly of our sins. We are so uncomfortable in the presence of God that we want to get it over fast. Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done it. Please help me not to do it again. Boom. And that's the extent of our confessing. 
and repenting. And I would suggest to you that we need to take long times where we're on our faces before God, crying out to Him and mourning our state and asking for God to work repentance even deeper into our hearts and to show us the things that continue to remain unhidden so we don't continue to go back into old patterns. And finally, every one of us here, let's look to the Lord Jesus. Amen? He was sexually pure. I'm always baffled by that verse in Hebrews where it says that he was tempted in every way like we are. Jesus was a real man and he was tempted sexually. And John said, in him there is no sin. Praise God for his perfect obedience because his perfect obedience and righteousness is given to me when I believed on him. Look at Jesus. He died for our sexual sins. He can cleanse that sin, forgive that sin. He is the healer who can break the attachments that bind us. He can heal the wounds that come from our sins. So as we look to the Lord Jesus, remember his words to the woman who was caught in the act of adultery after all of her accusers had left. He said said to her, I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. Would you stand, please? Father, as we engage each other, either after this service or around our lunch tables, or in our community groups, and discuss this message today, I pray that the Holy Spirit will help us not to avoid a difficult conversation, conversation, but that you you would lead us into honesty, into transparency, into confession, and into repentance that we might be a people purified for you and for your glory. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Just a brief reminder that if you'd like to give in the benevolent offering today, two plates are available at the back doors and you can contribute toward the relief effort in uh, Turkey. Um, I'm conscious this morning of a real spiritual struggle and I'm not surprised as we just sang, may I run the race before, before me strong and brave to face the foe. And there are some elements of the demonic that are often related uh, to sexual sin when people are bound. And so I'm not surprised that there's some pushback. And I would encourage you today that that is a sign that Jesus is here in power to change you, to transform you, that he is able to do that today. And so, Victory comes by submitting to him. Victory comes by making him Lord. Victory comes by placing our lives in, our, in the totality of our lives under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then victory over the enemy is finally achieved. Listen to these words from Jude 24. Words of hope. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. He is able to keep you from falling. If there's spiritual work that you need to do today, do it and don't do it fast. Get alone with God. Get alone with someone else who you need to open up to. Talk to me. Talk to a spiritual leader in the church. We're here to help you. I think what's holding revival back in the Church of Canada today is this sin. I think this is the sin. This is the sin. This is what's holding revival back. And God wants to pour out his spirit on us, but if we hang on to our, whoever covers the sin, you hang on to your sin, we will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes Sin finds mercy. And God will pour out his mercy in an abundant way. And God will 
God cannot, I have to be careful what I say because I don't want to put limitations on God. But God has chosen to limit himself in not using a people who are not fully consecrated to him. And when full consecration comes and full surrender of our hearts take place, and we allow even these private areas of our sexuality to go on the altar before God, then God with a consuming fire deals with that sin. And then he begins to move through us. Our world is sexually broken. It is the greatest sin of our day. It is the greatest idol of our day. And that idol cannot be smashed in Canada until it is smashed in the church. God, give us grace. God, give us grace. Amen.